All right, well, welcome everybody. Um, I think in this presentation, what I wanted to show was um, where we've been going with uh, JBase, especially around uh, objects, what's called dynamic objects. Um, it was a quick high overview um, based on your experience with uh, PIC. Um, I always view PIC as kind of an early object-based uh, database system, very, very early, comes out of, <coughs> say, the uh, late 60s, early 70s. And uh, so we have this weird format that most SQL people have a hard time quite understanding what we're doing. But when we look at the newer object syntaxes, um, it's a little easier to explain what we're doing. Um, and a lot of what we're going to be demonstrating here is the technology we're putting in place is to say, hey, if we can take a pick object and, and show it as a uh, more of a JSON style object, then things get uh, a lot easier and we can communicate with a lot of platforms, especially around the new RESTful interfaces and stuff. So I have a lot of videos that talk about that. But what I want to talk about here is this new technology we've been adding to JBase to make that type of development much easier. So in this session view, I'm going to take a few slides we did from Zoomapalooza <clears throat> last year that talks about a high level overview. And then I want to jump right into a uh, <clears throat> real world uh, example showing RESTful services and where this technology really makes it much easier and where you have kind of a future where you're going with the PIC platform. Based on the audience I have here, if you're on a pure PIC side, um, this kind of helps explain objects and compares them to what PIC is. If you're already from like the Java or C Sharp world, um, you already kind of understand this stuff, but it'll help you understand what type of objects and classes we are offering now in JBase. So, you know, first of all, what is an object? You know, it's really <clears throat> a structure. It's really an organizational structure around your, your functions and your, your database methods and your structure of your objects. Um, <clears throat> an object can have both properties and values, which like in our pick worlds are attributes and our values. But they also you you put your behaviors, you know, in our pick world, we call these our subroutines, but we of course have those all over the place in our system. What's nice in an object system is that you actually, if you have an order object, you'd actually put your things like a calculate tax or or read the order or write the order, it would all be methods within your object. Um, the objects in JBase are, are pretty simple. They're much more comparable to uh, JavaScript objects. They're uh, not uh, highly typed objects like a C Sharp or Java. Um, we'll, we'll slowly move more that direction the same way JavaScript is, but right now we want to get just the basics implemented in the platform. Um, and then again, like we said, the methods, that's really, you know, it says you're sending a message to the object, but it's really, it's for in, in a PIC platform, it's calling our functions or subroutines. So, you know, there's actually two pieces that we had to add to the platform is, is first of all, we need to have a an actual object data type, which is um, very comparable, like I said, to a JavaScript object for the for the PIC audience. Our PIC multi-value record structures are our objects, uh, other platforms objects. The big difference is they have a much more nicely named structure than we have. So uh, first thing we add to the platform is an actual object uh, type. And what you end up doing in the language is we'll actually be doing the conversion between a PIC object and a JavaScript object. Um, <clears throat> the nice thing about JavaScript objects is they're completely transportable. All platforms understand them. This is the basis of REST. So as we're calling our functions back and forth between our platforms, we're going to use JavaScript. Um, if you were familiar with SOAP or an XML in the prior generation, that was an earlier attempt to do this. JavaScript has a uh, has basically taken over that space. Um, it supports everything that a pick object can do, meaning it's got its name pair values, but it also supports arrays. And it can also go any number of dimensions deep, whereas pick can only go three dimensions. And as I said, it's completely platform independent. Um, the second piece we added was actual classes. We actually have added extensions to our pick basic to make it um, be able to work with these methods and classes. So we've had to add a few few enhancements to the system. You know, the first big one was you can actually put multiple subroutines or multiple functions or multiple classes, class methods within the same one PIC source code. Um, if you're familiar with PIC, how it normally works, we'd have a separate file for each one. Uh, the languages you would actually have all your uh, subroutines in the same uh, source file. Um, we had to make adjustments to allow 
a variable number of arguments to be passed in. Um, it's fully case insensitive. Um, and then it works seamlessly back and forth with our new object class with our new class methods. Um, to turn them on, um, we have a few switches to make the compiler understand these new syntaxes. Uh, you can either use a, a dot Java extension on your code, which usually is hard because you have to rewrite a lot of your code that way. Um, what I traditionally do is this options Java. And when you get to a point where you're using this new compiler across your platform, you can actually set environment variables and turn it on. A couple of restrictions as I start showing you what we're doing is uh, you do have to define that we're using a new compiler. Um, if we're going to put multiple functions and multiple subroutines within the same source code, we got to say we're starting a subroutine and ending a subroutine. And uh, when you compile and catalog those functions, you'll be compiling all the subroutines or functions within that source code. It's all or nothing. And then to our dynamic object syntax, um, like I said, it supports all the standard classes. You can say uh, create a new object. Um, it has uh, private variable space, which is a nice uh, addition now to pick. So as you create your classes, you can actually define your own private variables with the this uh, equals or uh, or self equals, just like in other languages. One big thing is, is it were our syntax for for doing the uh, operator between those things is a dash gator versus a dot. And we so we're much more like a, a um, C++. And of course, that was a requirement. If you've uh, ever seen PIC coding, we use dots in our field name, so we couldn't use a dot operator like you'd see in C sharp or uh, or Java or uh, or JavaScript. So it's a dash gator. And to see just a quick example of what this ends up looking like, you can see right here in PIC basic that we defined a new object. Um, again, this is more like JavaScript objects, so you can kind of build them on the fly. Um, in this case, we created a colors. It's a new array. We append some values into the array. We can uh, set booleans. We had to uh, put in features to support variable types that PIC doesn't uh, recognize, things like nulls, booleans. Um, those are all in there. And then as you can see in this code, we uh, punched it right out to JSON at the end. And that's really the, the key that we're looking for here is when we start doing RESTful interfaces and start talking with other platforms, we have to be able to take and convert and create these JSON objects and be able to consume these JSON objects. So this is really the, the main piece that I needed on the platform initially when we we're doing RESTful stuff. And then the classes are just a really nice addition on top of all that. Um, now that we have classes and objects in the system, we're actually starting to expose more of the internals of PIC and JBase through those classes. We have built in methods now. Um, this iterator is is kind of the version of a for each command you'd see in other languages. So if you wanted to, you could actually say, hey, do our loop statement against the iterator object um, and then pull the next object, which would let you iterate through an object. Typically in pick, we would do a, a, a decount and, and find out how many items are in there and, and do a loop incrementing through. But it's nice to start getting some of these other syntaxes. And again, these are these are things we're adding to the system that as we get to the next generation of developers, we're getting the the uh, the commands and stuff that they're used to seeing in the platform. Um, I want to go through these slides pretty quick because I want to jump uh, as fast as I can into a real world example and start showing um, actual database functions working on here. So um, this final thing is as we're building these objects, you know, classic object and class design is is you want to get very small methods that perform one and only one function, um, lots of little pieces. Um, one nice thing about objects is they are kind of self-documenting. And, and as you see other things we're going to do in the future, which is maybe getting code complete, um, being able to use Visual Studio Code and other nice new editors. A lot of this class definition <clears throat> is designed around making the IDE work better, meaning it actually understands your order object now and can actually um, help you correct your code as you're typing, but it needs to have these objects which are self-documenting to be able to do those type of tricks that you'll see in a Visual Studio with C Sharp and, and Java, where those languages are really nicely typed. They explain their objects very nicely. And then that's that the IDE, help you do uh, code complete, fix your code, catch errors, and all that type of stuff. So that said, let me jump right into really what I want to show here, which is how this actually ends up being implemented. 
And the first big item that we're all doing now is we're creating restful in endpoints and exposing our system out. Now, as we um, are either building new UIs or building integrations on the platform, REST is the de facto way of doing this. And we've had both MV Connect, which is cross-platform for all the PIC platforms, to help you create RESTful endpoints. And what I like to point out is, you know, we already have subroutines and functions in our system. REST is a way for us to expose those functions out to a Angular or a C-sharp developer to go and build um, interfaces. So what we end up having to do is build a, a RESTful endpoint with its router, and we have to be able to both consume JSON and produce JSON. And before we had objects, this is what the code would end up looking like. We would have a pick function where we were going to build an object, and we had this <coughs> object subroutine, <coughs> and it's available on all sub platforms where you would build a JSON object. And again, I hope uh, you guys have seen and understand what a JSON object looks like, but this is the code where I'd be taking a, a, a pick record and converting it over to look like JSON. And this is what the code would end up looking like. And to demonstrate what we're talking about here is in pick, we would have a an order, and all the pick guys would recognize this. Here is a standard report where I'm showing some pick data. But we all know that the problem with pick is that the data actually looks like this. It actually looks like this, and this is the problem with pick data. It's a very compact without the schema in it. And so the what we're trying to get to is a point where we can produce this pick data automatically to look like JSON, which is what everybody else wants to uh, see. So the code I was just showing you would produce that pick data out and it would look like JSON, which is what a normal external user is used to, to seeing. Now, talking about the benefits and the additions we're putting to the platform is this type of code is um, a little messy to deal with. With our new objects, the code ends up looking, this is the same pick code, but we're now converting our pick record, which was here's our attributes, one, two, uh, our dates are here, and we're getting to use nice object syntax. So we're creating an object on the fly. We're iterating here through our um, pick multi-value, which is the big power of pick, is that we did have a, a basically a, an array class in our system where we can store uh, all the invoice items in the same record. So here we are converting it out into separate items in a JSON array. And we're going to use this object syntax. <clears throat> so now this code is doing in a few lines of code what I was doing over here and quite a few more lines of code. So that was the first addition to the platform. With an object class, we can now produce out the JSON for our RESTful endpoints and then consume JSON coming in and do the opposite, which would be to take the objects and store them back in a pick array. And this is what, what I call ETL. This is the work we need to do. And, and once we get these out, we can now expose out any of our objects. But as I was looking at this stuff, I said, look, we, we want to reuse this type of stuff within the pick platform itself. It'd be nice to actually be able to code and reuse these objects. And this is where the classes start to come into play. So here you see us doing the object. I'm doing the ETL work right within the RESTful endpoint. But what if I was to instead go over and create here, which is an independent orders class or an order class um, in other platforms? And this is where you get to see the new, the new uh, pick basic extensions. Uh, come into play. And so what we see here is we've created code. We said, hey, we're going to use the new Java extensions. And this here, this method line here, is where we are defining our class methods. 
and we're going to create order. It's a double semicolon. And then over here on the right, we put our actual method names. This is the automatic uh, first order um, iterator that so when somebody creates a new order object, it's going to always going to call this section of code. And you see me in here setting up our own private variables to store some stuff. We open up our pick file. And then we define a private variable within that class to store our our open variable. So it's still this is all standard pick code. This is really just a, a subroutine. But it's got private variable space. So I'm able to see here and say I'm going to open up the order. If it doesn't work, I'm doing some error handling where I'm going to populate an error variable. And, and return my error. And then the way the normal class stuff works is that we're going to go through here now and put all our operators and the operators we're traditionally going to have with any data object is first we got to be able to read in a record. We got to be able to write a record. We've got to be able to set variables, get variables. And then the big power is, is that we would extend this object out to have things like um, calculate order, calculate shipping, calculate uh, taxes. Um, starting with our read record, and again, because these are much more like JavaScript objects, how we design our object is is really up to you. Um, I'm just playing around some different ideas here, but bottom line is I say, hey, I'm going to have a, a read method. You're going to pass me an ID. I'm going to get my variable. I'm going to store the uh, pick variables within some private space. I'm going to read my I pick variable right here, do my error handling. And I chose right here, guys, to actually say, hey, I want to do some ETL work. That same work I was showing over here in my original REST routine where I was converting the pick object over, I'm doing it here now within a class library because I can then reuse it. So I'm going to sit here and do exactly the same work, convert a, and create an object of my pick object and I just chose to store it in a sub object within the uh, within the class here. Then I created a little method that here that says, hey, I can return the, the pick raw record if you really want it. Um, and then I do the exact opposite and I create a write method where I'm basically converting the JSON object back to a pick record. So you see me right here, pull back in there. Um, we had everything stored in here in our object record, so I'm putting it right back into a pick record. Here is how I can iterate now through a JSON object where it's storing all our uh, uh, product lines, rebuild our pick record, and write it back out to disk. Here's a delete method I'd, I'd put in here to delete the file. I haven't done anything. And and as I was playing with this, this was one way to do it, but if uh, if I have Java people, listing on the call. Um, you may actually want to do more extensive work here, so I could always create a set and get method and, and set my pick variables and structures through a get and set and start putting things like date conversions and, and data validation in here. But a few hundred lines of code, we've created a, a, a sample function, but then I'm going to go over and pick code and call that class method. And this is just a real quick, simple pick program showing how I do that. So now I say order equals new object of order, which was our original class. I'm now going to do an order calling my read method, passing my ID. You can see here where I'm referencing my error variable. Here I'm pulling in the raw pick record through calling my record method. Here you can see me actually reaching into the pick object and getting this my different variables like customer ID. I can set them here. Here I'm going to convert my order object back to JSON and here I'm going to write it back out to disk. So this is this is your more object oriented programming, which is now an option with pick. It will work seamlessly. With your existing pick code, you can have these classes call your existing pick code and you can start organizing your structures down. So this is not a one or the other type thing. So to show this actual in operation now. We call it test order object, test order object. And you'll see now when I ran that routine that I had told it to print out the result code, I told it to print out the customer ID, I told it to now 
take that object I created and convert it to JSON. And here I have a debug statement, so it shows all your debugging stuff still works, and I can see here where I was rebuilding my JSON back to a pick record and writing it back out to disk. Now, you know, where do I want to go with this and what's the big benefit that I get with that type of, of coding is I can now go back to my RESTful endpoint code that we were doing and rewrite that code. Which remember originally here we were doing the ETL work all here within the RESTful endpoint code. I can now take that same code and say, just create myself an order object as I'm looping through here because this is creating a uh, uh, an array of records. I can say, hey, just do my order, read my record in, and then store um, my order object into my records array. So all that code now is reusable as a class, and I can now use it in my RESTful endpoint, and this code now will generate the same exact code that we had in the first one, which would be uh, and now that same routine is producing JSON the same way the other function was running. So yeah, I, I ran through this pretty quick, but I wanted and hopefully that gives a pretty good understanding of, of what we're trying to bring to the platform and uh, and what classes and objects bring to you and why they're so important, whereas we're trying to build out the pick data. And our real goal is to get to a point where once these classes are in, because this is a good way that we describe our data, that then I can get to a point where we can actually start uh, doing things such as when you see me do a version of our sort verb, which is now on the fly generating JSON. The truth is behind the, the scenes, I'm calling that same class library to generate my my JSON output. So again, thank you for watching and have a great day.